estou no mes, na mesma situação aqui. Aqui eu, Jonathan. Pois eu acho Carlos. que só o Jonathan, vocês aí 10 anos mais novos, né? Todos, <risos> todos leptos e fagueiros conseguem fazer isso, viu? Essa coisa de videoconferência, viu, Jonathan? Isso não é de Deus, não. Tu vai matar minha amiga Mariana, tá? Pois é, minha filha. Aqui o ritmo é frenético para acompanhar esse Jonathan aí. Jonathan, como é que tu consegue fazer isso? Toda semana, né, Mariana? Toda tu semana. Assim. É. É, é... Toda semana, toda semana. Vocês estão e... gravando para colocar depois em e-books, alguma coisa assim, Mariana? A gente está fazendo tudo uh, ao vivo no YouTube, no nosso canal, e fica tudo guardado, registrado e disponível para os alunos lá no canal. Olha aí, Jonathan, mais um trabalho para a Mariana, depois coloca isso aí e -book, em mandar... livros, viu? Foi. É, então, já surgiu a ideia, já, já está surgindo essa é ideia. Tanta, é, é tanta informação... É tanta informação maravilhosa, viu? Eu, eu confesso que eu não conheço informações maravilhosas, Mariana, que você e o Jonathan estão trazendo para a universidade, né, como um todo, para a academia, que eu acho assim... É, parabéns aí para a professora Fernanda também, eu não sei se já está com a gente, né? eu não sei exatamente... Ela hoje é. não vai poder, a Fernanda é nossa proreitora e ela não vai poder estar hoje, ela acabou de me mandar uma mensagem. Sim. Pois Mas é. semana que vem você vai estar de novo, você vai conhecê-la. Não, de novo eu vou só escutar, viu, Mariana? Mas eu te digo o seguinte, assim, é realmente para mim, eu confesso para vocês, que a minha segunda língua hoje é o francês. Então, se você não tiver vítima para o francês, você pode me chamar que eu falo com mais facilidade. É, o inglês mas... eu estudei high school, né? Então, mas aí preparei aqui o dever de casa direitinho, né? Tal, vamos ver. Sim, sim, vai, vai dar certo. Eu estou preocupada... Professora com... Gina, a senhora precisa de aprender com os dois, porque parece que os dois incorporam. É, é, porque o doutor Jonathan, dentro dele, mora um italiano, mora um alemão, mora um francês, mora um espanhol, mora é. um americano, dentro da doutora Mariana também. Eles respiram fundo, assim, ó, incorpora, brota aquele italiano, aquele francês, aquele alemão, aquele inglês, a gente não sabe de onde, professora, e sai. O que, que a gente ótimo. precisa aprender com eles é como fazer essa incorporação. Pois. A aula tá ali teatro. neles, entendeu? É aula de teatro, Sinara. <risos> Enfim, que bom, viu, Sinara? Eu vou, vou praticar hoje para incorporar. Por enquanto, eu só estou incorporando aqui o castigo de coordenar 21 professores numa época de pandemia, viu? Eu não sei como. É, aqui a gente está com poucos, gente. São só 19. É, <risos> então... é grande também, né, Jonathan? É, é complicado, viu? Complicado. É. Eu estava falando antes da gente abrir aqui que eu já estou preocupado com esse nosso semestre. E tem muitas atividades para todo mundo aí, então as pessoas precisam a, a se apurar. Hello, hello, Monta. How are you? Can you hear me? I think you, you need to open your microphone. Hi, everybody. Oh, yes, Hi. now it's working. Hi. Oh, at last. Welcome, my friend. Nice to meet you again. Sorry about, um, yeah, sorry about the delay. No worry. No. We are online on YouTube now. Okay. And you need to tell me about your PowerPoint. Okay. Do, do you need so, some help? Let me see. Let me try the sharing the screen. Um, host disabled participants screen sharing. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Mariana, clica no verdinho do lado. Já cliquei, já cliquei. Ah, okay. It's, it's working now. It's Try working. again, please. Okay. Um. In any case, I have uh, your presentation in my computer, so I can help okay. you. Okay, how do I make this presentation full screen? Um, F5, maybe? F5. Oh, no. Yes, yes, it's working. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But, just, darling, uh, we need just to two start. Se two seconds. It's working, but we need to start with my coordinator. 
he will start it formally talking to, to our students. So, and after yeah. that, you can start your PowerPoint, okay? So you have to, to stop uh, sharing, then you can share again. Okay, sorry about that. No, no worries. <laughs> Okay, so Mariana, do what? What do we do now? Do do yeah, I just yeah, start? So you have to stop sharing. Yes, I can. I can do okay, it for you. Yeah. It's okay. No, it's all, uh, she already done. So, uh, in any case, I'll start. Then I'll I'll pass the word to Mariana. Then she'll present you. Then you start the PowerPoint. Present. Do your presentation. Then I believe Professor Deborah. Then Gina. Then. Yes. Carlos, then whoever wants to speak. This is the plan. Okay. Yeah. So I'm on the screen now, I think. Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Jonathan Barros Vita, uh, professor and director of the master's and PhD program of Unimar, University of Marilia. And I'm really glad to, to welcome everyone to our YouTube channel and to everyone that follow us on, on Instagram, Facebook, and everyone that keeps uh, supporting our projects in this pandemic time. It's really nice when you have uh, foreign lecturers and, from, and now I think we are finishing all the continents because we already had people from many continents, from many languages. And I think that this is really a milestone for us. So the internationalization part of our program is being really well developed. We already had some initiatives on this, uh, on the Wednesday project, which is hosted by Professor Mariana. We already had many um, other foreign uh, professors in my project on Fridays. And also we had uh, some on Professor Bruno's. And it's really interesting to see how the pandemics has shortened all the distances and has allowed us to host people from many nationalities and from many different backgrounds. So this, in spite of being the pandemic a really bad thing for the health and for everyone, at least it has shortened the distances and has allowed us to do that. And we are doing the role of the university, which is opening our doors and opening uh, and giving the society some knowledge and some relief in these difficult times. And therefore, I say that we, you, uh, Professor uh, Munta Ito, is really welcome to our PhD program and master's program alongside my dear friend, Professor Gina, my co professor from the, the PhD program, Professor Carlos, Professor Sinara, and also not forgetting Professor Deborah, which is also here, not for the first time, for, but she already, already has been here for several times. So welcome everyone. And I give the floor to Mariana, who is, as I said, brilliantly hosting this project. And for sure, this will be a really interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Jonathan, for, for your words and all the support to this project. And hello, everyone, all the students and professors. Uh, for those who don't know me yet, my name is Mariana Santiago, and I am professor of the postgraduate program at the University of Marília Law Program. Uh, I hope you all are well and safe in these difficult times of pandemic. Uh, it's not easy for, for, for anyone. And we, we, we will start now our weekly event uh, titled Dialogues on Development, Company and Society. It's uh, an event organized by University of Marilia, uh, originally for, for our students, but, but now it's completely open to all the law community. It was getting bigger and bigger, and I am very, very glad that you are with us today. I see um, that we have with us today students and professors from different places in Brazil, so welcome everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure today to have with us uh, Munta Ito from Scotland. 
She is attorney and president of Nature's Right NGO. And she's also part of the United Nations project called Harmony with Nature, just as me. Uh, my students already know what it is, but we have all that information in, in our website uh, if, you, if you want to see more about this. And her lecture will be also about rights of nature. He's uh, one of the most important uh, experts on this, that theme uh, of the world. Uh, the subject is extremely important and it's in line with our classes in the University of Marilia. We already work on the STEM. Uh, I would like to mention the presence to, uh, today of Professor Dr. Gina Pompeo from University of Fortaleza, a dear friend, a great professor, and also Professor Dr. Deborah Costa from Catholic University of Sao Paulo. And she's leading now a, a group of students from that university, one of the most important universities in Brazil. And welcome uh, my dear colleague at University of Marília, Professor Dr. Carlos Bittencourt. They will discuss the topic with us in a dialogue. Uh, thank you, professors, for being here with us today. Uh, I have to say thank you, Professor Maria Elena Diniz and her International Law Institute for supporting this event. Um, so finally, uh, I wish everyone a great event. Uh, dear Monta Ito, I'm so, so glad that you are here with us today. Feel free to start to lecture and we look forward to, to hearing you. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I feel very honored to be here and to share something about the rights of nature and, uh, and my work with um, the Brazilian students. I feel that um, we are at a critical juncture in the um, history of humanity where our trajectory as to how we go forward very much depends on the steps that we take in the next few years. And um, I feel that, you know, with the pandemic in particular, that um, where the only real answer is a strong immune system. We cannot rely on vaccines and things like this endlessly. Um, prevention, things that only act on the symptoms. We have to look at root causes and we have to look at building health. And we can see, you know, with the pandemic that the health of the biosphere, uh, the health of human beings are not two, they're one. Um, we cannot have healthy human beings in a sick biosphere. And, and this is where I'm coming from with rights of nature. It's a, it's a very deep reorientation um, of our societal systems. And I see law as the, the instrument, the tool that programs our societal systems to operate in a particular way. So when the way I look at rights of nature, it's not looking at it as a litigation tool, although it can be a litigation tool. I'm looking at it as a deep, a structural change to the operating system that drives our society to operate in, in, in a, a degenerative, extractive manner rather than a regenerative manner that gives regenerative outcomes. So really nature's rights, at the core of it, we're talking about valuing life. So it's, it's an approach that moves from the utility value of nature to the intrinsic value of nature. And the same with human beings. You know, we, just as we value nature at the moment for its utility, its use to human beings, um, we also value each other only in that way. If, if we are useful, then we are valuable. If we are not useful to society, we are considered to be worthless. And, um, and so this move from, from uh, 
utility value to intrinsic value, things being valuable just because they are, because they are part of the web of life. Everything in the web of life is sacred. Everything in the web of life has intrinsic value. This is something very core to nature's rights. And in that sense, when we are recognizing the rights of nature and law, we're protecting the fundamental basis of our own right to life. So how can we say that we have a right to life if that which gives us life doesn't have a corresponding right to life. So really this is, things have gotten so bad in our world that we have to go one deeper than human rights and we have to see where does our life derive from? It derives from nature, we are nature. So nature's rights is like a, a moral blueprint to reorientate our societal values towards well-being and regeneration. And it's using law as a tool to bring about a kind of program social transformation. Um, so I'm going to now run through um, some basic points on my presentation. Um, so I'll share some diagrams with you and we'll walk through the diagrams. Um, I understand many people uh, have seen my TED talk and uh, will have read uh, the uh, book chapter that I wrote on rights of nature in the European Union. So I won't go so much into details, but I'll try and get more to the essence and the, the core um, of the message. Uh, and then of course you can ask questions. Okay, so nature's rights, we are nature. So one of the, um, the main uh, misconceptions about the rights of nature is that it's about nature and nature is something separate to us. So this is the first reframing that uh, no, it's not about nature against us. It's about all of us together. We are nature. When we recognize nature's rights, we're recognizing one of our most fundamental rights. And times have gotten so bad in our society that we have to put this into law. So here I'm sharing with you the iceberg model of current reality. So if you imagine, so this is a picture of an iceberg and the very top part is the top of the iceberg, what we can see when we look at an iceberg from land. And if we were to think of this as human society, this is all the visible effects, all the crises, um, you know, the climate change, the deforestation, the uh, sixth mass extinction, the pandemics, all this kind of thing. And most of our solutions, most of our institutions, NGOs and the likes, um, and law as well, tries to tackle that part of the iceberg, but only the part that is visible above the surface. However, those visible results are generated by invisible structures, paradigms of thought and consciousness. And that's what lies beneath the surface. So with rights of nature, we work at the level of the consciousness, the paradigm, because the deeper you go into the iceberg, the more leverage you have. So what we're trying to do with rights of nature is by changing that consciousness, by changing that, that paradigm, and then change, using law to change the structures, we then start to produce different visible effects. So, so this is a, a kind of long-term solution. So applying that iceberg model more to our nature's rights um, system, if we are to look at the current iceberg, um, we have a starting point of separation, separation consciousness. And that separation consciousness gets expressed as the mechanistic paradigm worldview that came about in the um, in, in, in the 16th, 17th century, based on outdated science. And that 
mechan yet that mechanistic paradigm, even though it's based on outdated science, is very much alive and it drives our structures today. So that gives rise to silo systems and structures. So this is the fragmented approach where you have economy separate to ecology, um, separate to agriculture, separate to energy, separate. Even though these are all facets of the same society, um, they operate as if they're all independent to each other. And this, these silo systems are held in place by laws that deem nature to be objects, resources, and properties. It's a mechanistic worldview. Um, and the structures that, uh, that arise from that are all held in place by this construction of nature as objects, resources, and property. And then that gives rise to what I call degenerative outcomes. Um, where nature is just free for the taking, you get the ecological crisis. It gives rise to things like um, agriculture that destroys the earth, um, an economic system based on infinite growth, um, energy system that uh, depletes nature faster than she can replenish. And all of that is, is generated on autopilot. So you get visible effects like the ecological crisis, poverty and inequality, because also remember the fragmented um, worldview, the mechanistic worldview took root also with the rise of property rights, which then led to the rise of the corporation, which then became an institution of exclusion. And um, in that institution of exclusion, it allowed for the conversion of commons into property and then now into capital. And so all of this, this, um, this fundamental basis of nature being objects, resources and property rather than rather rather than um, you know community of interconnected living beings um, has also facilitated the concentration of wealth and power that we can see in our world today so that's why another degenerative outcome is the inequality and the poverty um, pandemics because of the weakened immune system you have the climate crisis alienation people feeling separate to each other not valued um, I spoke a little bit earlier about being valued only if you are deemed to be useful by society, um, not because we are. Um, the sixth mass extinction, um, because biodiversity has no value uh, in our society. So as I said before, the deeper that we, the deeper we go down the iceberg um, and the, deep, the deeper levels that we take action, the more leverage we have. So, at Nature's Rights, we say we need to change the paradigm, we need to transform the system, and we need to embody the change. We need to be the change, we need to live it. And, and this is the change in consciousness. So from separation consciousness to unity consciousness, that we are all part of one living web of life. And I feel during the pandemic, since we're all going through this, this very difficult experience, um, on a, on a global level, I feel that um, this sense that we're all in it together um, has, has deepened. And, you know, even if we're only thinking of it in terms of human health at the moment, the same is true for the rest of the biosphere. If we think about the, um, the environmental issues that we are facing and the existential crisis that is looming ahead um, with climate change and the likes. So, so this change from separation consciousness to unity consciousness, if we look at the nature's rights iceberg, that then gives rise to a holistic paradigm worldview, the living, living planet, human as part of the web of life. Uh, and from that holistic paradigm worldview, you have it held in place by laws recognizing the interdependence for life, like earth jurisprudence, nature's rights, whole systems. This then gives us whole system structures. So instead of having economics separate to 
agriculture, separate to urban environments, separate to um, energy, and so so on. You you um, economy that is that that works in, integrally with um, ecology, with agriculture, with the urban system. So everything becomes is is by design part of a whole, and designed to give regenerative outcomes. So if we're recognizing the interdependence of all of life, and if we're saying that nature has rights, and it's not just property, resources, objects, um, but they're interconnected living beings that have the right to thrive, to flourish, and so on. Um, if you follow that through, what would that mean for agriculture? What would that mean for energy? Um, you cannot have an agricultural system that destroys nature. You cannot have an energy system that destroys nature. Um, we have to be more creative than that. And, and this is the, the whole system structure. And then that would give regenerative outcomes where you'd get regenerative distributive economies because you couldn't have an economy based on infinite growth um, that is extractive by nature. Um, You'd get uh, pandemic resilience because people would be um, whole system structures, uh, recognize the independence of all life would mean that a lot of things that undermine human health, um, you know, like if you were to take the agro uh, chemical uh, complex, the agrochemical business and all of the pesticides and uh, the pollutants and all of the things that we have, well, all of these would also become a thing of the past. So you would get people more healthy, um, greater health, well-being, connection. We're coming from unity consciousness and a holistic worldview. The human is part of the web of life. As we become more connected with nature, we also feel the connection with each other. Climate resilience, thriving ecosystems, thriving biodiversity. So we start to, on autopilot, generate these regenerative outcomes. Now, another way of expressing it, we have the degenerative cycle. So you start with the separation consciousness, the earth as a machine, human separate from nature, the win-lose paradigm in law. Um, and you come to mechanistic paradigm, mechanistic worldview encoded in law, um, as nature as objects, resources, and property. Now, in this degenerative cycle, law just manages externalities. And uh, in my article, I went to many of the, the, the structural problems with environmental law. One of the main problems is that uh, environmental law is seen as a, you know, just a discrete sort of silo unit by itself, yet laws that affect all of the societal systems affect nature. Um, you know, for example, economy based on infinite growth, or agriculture that destroys the earth. Or, although the laws that govern these areas, they're not dovetailed uh, with environmental laws. So they, um, you know, they operate on their own, yet they have an impact on, on the outcomes um, within so, so there's, you know, this lack of integration with the other policy areas. Um, there's also poor access to justice because, um, poor access to justice because um, we live in a society with the inequality um, where we have economies that concentrate wealth and power. And at the moment, most of the wealth and power is concentrated in very large corporations. And if you have a small community trying to take a large corporation to court, you have in unequal power in a win-lose system of law. So, you know, so there's the access to justice issue, the, the law. The law is also mechanistic and they're quantitative. They don't align with how ecosystems operate. Um, the laws, uh, environmental issues are restricted to the planning and the administrative courts where you can only bring judicial review. So you cannot have a conversation in court about um, actual root causes. Um, also planning law doesn't take into account cumulative effects. So on the face of it, a development, one development looked at on its own might seem fine, but if you have hundreds of them all over the country, they don't look very good for the ecosystem, but that is not taken into account. Um, 
you know, also the fact that coming back to, uh, yeah, the issue of relationship in law, because nature objects, resources and property, the relationship, the fundamental relationship that we have with the natural world isn't realized in law, let alone that it's our most fundamental relationship because it's the relationship from which our very life derives. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I mentioned a little bit about the quantitative approach. And biodiversity is a very good example of where this doesn't work. The endangered species listing system, um, where in the time that it takes to uh, do the research to list a species, it's already too late. And also it doesn't take into account um, that species that are, the loss of species that are not listed um, you know, and the impact that that has on the ecosystem. Take, for example, bees. Not a single species of bee is listed in the European Union, yet if bees went, you know. So, so the protection is piecemeal in the current system. And then it relies a lot on agencies and institutions to, to implement, and often they are underfunded, um, you know. And so basically, all of this allows, it legalizes degenerative structures. In the beginning, there was colonialism, enclosure of the commons. This is what property law, um, you know, and then corporate law uh, started to legitimize, um, which led to the concentration of wealth and power, economy based on infinite growth, agriculture that destroys the earth, and energy that depletes nature faster than she can re regenerate. Um, and then that gives rise to the degenerative outcomes that we saw, the sixth mass extinction, the climate crisis, poverty, ecosystem collapse, and so on. And instead, we can have a regenerative cycle, a cycle based on life, where we start with unity consciousness, um, holistic paradigm and worldview, which is then encoded in laws, nature's rights, and earth jurisprudence, which can then scale up regenerative structures, regenerative systems. So you'd have distributive economies, uh, regenerative agriculture, renewable energy, uh, ecosystem restoration, well-being indicators for progress, eco-villages, um, and robust biodiversity protection, and, and so on. And whilst these things exist at the moment, they exist around the periphery of a core structure based on destruction. The difference is these things will become the mainstream and, the, and the, the law, the legal process will actually scale those up. So things like subsidies to industries that infringe nature's rights will no longer be legal. That money can also be diverted to scale up the regenerative structures, which then of its own accord produce this virtual cycle of regenerative outcomes, thriving ecosystems, thriving communities, prosperity, increased health and well-being which then reinforces the unity consciousness and you start to produce well-being. So um, one more thing I want to talk about is uh, a workable model for nature's rights. So if you look at the diagram on the left, the current sustainability model, um, you have the three overlapping circles, people, nature, and economy. Now, this is very much in that uh, fragmented silo worldview where it's assumed that the three circles can operate independently of each other, that people can exist independent of nature, that economy can exist independent of people. And uh, we know that this is nonsense uh, because the only one that can exist independent of the others in those three circles is nature. So, in the rights of nature model, um, we feel that the three concentric circles where you have a nested hierarchy of systems, nested dependencies uh, is more accurate. So where you have nature uh, as the dominant system, um, human society as a subsystem of nature and economy as a subsystem of human society because Without um, nature, human society would not exist. And without economy, um, sorry, without human society, economy wouldn't exist. So similarly from that can flow a hierarchy of rights where you would have 
nature's rights, from which derive human rights, from which derive corporate and property rights. And in this model, the, the rights would be synergistic to each other because it wouldn't make sense to have competing rights. Um, if you had an economic or a property right that worked against human rights, you would start to unravel the meta system from which it derives. The same if you had a human right that went against nature's rights, you'd start to unravel the meta system. So in this model, in the hierarchy of rights, the rights are operating synergy. So you could only have a corporate right or a property right if it enhanced the rights of people, um, human rights. And you could only have a human right if it enhanced nature's rights. So, so in that way, we ensure the integrity of the whole. Um, now, moving to the diagram uh, on the right, if we were to draw those three concentric circles in 3D, you can see in the top three, you have, the, you have economy, people, nature, and you can see how this all corresponds to the sustainable development goals. And we can see how the biosphere forms the basis of um, the sustainable development goals. And if we were to add to that a fourth tier, which would be the planetary boundaries, um, we start to see a working model for the implementation of Earth jurisprudence um, and a legal framework that, that could, could hang off this using already existing and widely accepted um, parameters as, as our starting point. Um, so, yeah, at the moment, um, when we look at rights, human rights are only enforceable against governments. They're not enforceable against corporations. In the nature's rights model, uh, we therefore would have to create our own operating systems and our own uh, reframing of the notion of rights. Um, because if we were to just take nature's rights and drop it into the existing system, there is a big risk that it would be in the same realm as human rights, not enforceable against corporations, and corporations are the ones who are destroying nature, so it would be completely nonsensical. So in this way, we would need um, nature's rights to come with its own operating system that reframes all of that rights-based framework into a, a nested hierarchy of rights. Um, yeah, and in that way, what we're doing is where um, all we're doing is recognizing uh, fundamental realities of our existence and where we're getting the law to align with the reality of, uh, of how things actually work in, in a virtuous cycle. Um, right, so I've included bringing the stakeholders on board. So this is a very interesting model that I quite like. The three horizons you may have heard of it quite often people say well with nature's rights you know how do, how do we talk to corporations or governments or you know nobody will go for it because they're going to lose out well in the three horizons model if you look at horizon one this is the mainstream system at the moment this is our corporations and our governments and our economic system based on infinite growth and all of that. And as we can see, over time, horizon one will start to decline. And I think we are in that declining phase. And, and then we have two other horizons. So horizon three is like the nature's rights. This horizon three are things that are on the fringes at the moment or just emerging that are more aligned with the world that we are going to be moving into. Um, the bright, new, more evolved society um, that we're looking forward to. And, uh, and there will be many different types of Horizon 3s, as many Horizon 3s as there are visions of what the future could look like. Um, in Nature's Rights case, we're looking at a thriving biosphere, thriving human communities, more equitable, more compassionate, um, more loving based on unity consciousness. And um, so Horizon 3 
And when horizon one is at its peak, horizon three is at its lowest. But there comes a point where horizon one starts to crash and horizon three starts to gain a bit of traction. And, and it goes up to become the new H1. So it becomes the new mainstream. Horizon two is something that develops in the middle of the two. And uh, it's kind of like a halfway house. And uh, horizon two could either get co-opted to prolong the life of horizon one, or um, it could be a bridge towards supporting horizon three. So there comes a time, and I would say we're, we're probably sort of around this, um, place where horizon one, horizon two are, are crossing, um, where horizon one starts to decline and horizon two starts to come up. So fossil fuels are declining, renewables are coming up. But as I mentioned in my article, you know, there are also limits on mass production of renewables because we have the natural limits of the planet. And so there's policy of sufficiency and you know, and, uh, and a, a whole different view of sustainability, much more cohesive, much more integrated that we bring with nature's rights is, um, you know, is really what we're looking for. So you'll see, you know, H horizon two has its day and then it starts to, as it starts to decline, that's when horizon three starts to come up. Now the timeline, um, you know, the world in turbulent transition as it is now, I mean, we have no idea what the timeline is. It could be, it could be very quick in times like, like ours, you know, that horizon two could be very short lived. And the graphs don't have to follow this pattern. They can follow all kinds of patterns. Um, but the general gist is that this is about the evolution of systems. All dominant systems will decline and fall away. And all, you know, and emerging systems will take their place and become the dominant system of, uh, of what, of what, of a new tomorrow. And uh, so if we were to use a three horizons framing, it's possible to have an inclusive discussion with everybody because the, um, the evolution of systems is something that is impersonal. It's, it's not to do with agendas. And so in this way, we can work collaboratively with Horizon 1, Horizon 2. Horizon 1 understand that they're on their way out, you know, and, and we're the new future. Uh, Horizon 1, who has all the resources, could divert resor resources and help Horizon 3 to gain more visibility, could also help Horizon 2. You know, similarly, Horizon 2, if it is it just propping up Horizon 1, and if it knows that it, that is short-lived, it can then you know, try to act more as a bridge to Horizon 3 since that's, you know, what's going to be up and coming. So, so that's, um, this is, a, this model was developed by the International um, Futures uh, Organization and uh, I feel can be useful for having an inclusive um, and non-adversarial <laughs> discussion um, around how societies evolve. Okay, so um, let's see how I come out of this presentation. Okay, so does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Thank you, dear Monta. Uh, your presentation was perfect and excellent. And I love the way you, you, you show about uh, uh, the differences uh, between sustainable development and rights of nature. But I think the students uh, cannot see, cannot saw, couldn't saw your PowerPoint material. I oh think no! Some, uh, some, uh, somehow it happened. And I would <laughs> like to ask you to show uh, a uh, slide uh, that I think it's so important. I will try to, to do it now. Okay, all right, let's 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 try it again. Uh, can... it, it's a graphic. Yeah. This, this and one? And it shows uh, as specifically how it's different because yeah. the, you have the, the discuss about sustainability and nature, people and economy but it's not the same thing. 
a study about uh, talking about rights of nature. It's another model. So exactly. sometimes I feel it's difficult to my students to understand because you have a, a international uh, subject, uh, some kind of discourse, and it's so deep uh, into your perspective. And I think uh, it's important to, to talk about this change of paradigm. Absolutely. You used yeah. to talk about uh, 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 how it's a box and we have to get out of this box. And uh, some civilizations around the world in the past fall felt uh, because this impossibility of changing paradigm. And I think it's so special. So to my students, just uh, take memory, take, take some notes because it's important. Yeah. Uh, can the students see the presentation now? Yes, it's perfect now. Okay, so, um, and then these are the other, these are the icebergs that I spoke about. Let me show I can, you. I can send uh, this file, you can send it to the students with the diagrams. Yes, it will be nice. Thank yeah. you so much. I think, I think it makes it clearer, you know, to, to see it visually. But if you look at the current sustainability model, it's not been updated since the 50s. And look at our nature's rights model. It's so much more sophisticated than, and using also existing, you know, existing indicators, targets, markers, you know, that, uh, I mean, you cannot compare the two, <laughs> I feel. So sorry about it. Uh, it was absolutely my fault. Sorry. Huh? This thing about the, the, the PowerPoint presentation. Ah, okay. But if okay. I can share with, with the students, I think it's okay. It will be fantastic. Yeah, no, that's great. If, uh, yeah, if they can see this model here at the moment, I mean, yeah, the current sustainability model, the three circles and then the concentric circles and yeah. And then the 3D depiction with the sustainable development goals and the planetary boundaries. Um, yeah. Okay, my In friend. Let's let's talk a little with Professor Deborah Costa. I think uh, she also has some presentation to show you to show it, to show us to us. Professor Deborah, I will try to help you with your slides. Okay. Okay. I'm if it here. doesn't work, uh, it, it's my fault because I have. Uh, my abilities is not so good with this uh, uh, technique on the internet. Don't worry, it's only illustrative, not okay. Uh, can you hear me? It's okay, the sound? Yes, I yes? can hear okay. you. Can I start? <laughs> yes, feel free. Okay, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's my Just honor. put the presentation on. Ah, okay, yes. You can put it. It's okay? Mm. Not yet. Just, just give me a minute. I think, it, mm. I think now it's okay. Okay, okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's my honor and my privilege to be here today and address all of you, students and professors. And I do hope you are well and safe. I would like to thank professors Maria Elena Diniz, Mariana Santiago, Jonathan Vita, Sinara Lacerda, Fernanda Serva, Gina Pompeo, and Carlos Francisco for this great opportunity. I'm very happy to be here today, and I wish we have a great event. And thank you so much, Montaito, for being an inspiration to all of us and for sharing your brilliant ideas. I think that since World War II, I can say that we have never been so vulnerable. Vulnerability brought by COVID-19 is pointing out that a change is needed. In fact, a paradigm shift is urgent. If we don't redesign our society, embracing a holistic legal system, 
in which animals and nature are subject of rights and granted personhood, society will be marching to a collapse. Uh, right now we are living a crisis of global solidarity and facing the risk of a global decline. We ask ourselves if the virus COVID-19 was created by scientists in a clean lab or came from a dirty market where all sorts of animals are sold for food. Of course, it's a very complex issue to cope with. Investigations are needed to find the origin of the virus, how the virus entered the human population and the role of animals in this disease. Jane Goddard, the English lady who lived her life studying chimpanzees in Tanzania, warned us about the dangers of humans crowding out the natural world. She said that like the corona and HIV and AIDS and all sorts of other diseases we catch from animals is partially to do with the destruction of the environment. Animals lose habitat, they get crowded together and are into closer contact with humans. She says that we are so disrespecting animals. We kill them, we eat them, we traffic them, we send them off to wild animal markets. We are treating living beings as objects of property, looking for short-term monetary gain or power rather than the health of the planet. So your words, Montaito, made an impact on me when I heard your TED, I listened to your TED talk, and I want to recall them. You have said, there are universal laws that govern all life. When we are aligned with them, we create a circle of peace, harmony, and prosperity for our life. When we are not aligned, we create a spiral of destruction as we can see in the world today. All societies that have ignored this truth have perished. That's what I fear. If we keep on damaging the environment, disrespecting non-human animals, acting towards society, looking at short-term economic benefit, we lose all the spiritual connection with natural world. But if we make ethical choices, says Jane Goodall, then we can start moving towards a world that will be not quite so desperate to leave to our great grandchildren. And what are ethical choices? Peter Singer remarks, my ethics come from considering the consequences of my actions for all of those who get affected by them. It's kind of golden rule, a golden rule worth applying. A while after the nuclear bomb had destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Albert Einstein was in a dinner with friends. He was not, war was not a subject he likes talking. And he was asked about what weapons would be used to fight the Third World War. And he answered he had no idea. But regarding the environmental damages, he believed the weapons used in the Third World War would be so devastating that civilization as we know today would be gone, no longer exist. Mariana, acho que a gente tem, we have a picture, sorry. This is the atomic bomb and the Enola Gay, uh, the plane that dropped the two bombs, one in Nagasaki and the other one in Hiroshima. And we can see in the other pictures, the, the destruction. This is, uh, the picture is not very good because of the resolution. It's uh, 1945 uh, and then we have another one. So Albert, Albert Einstein believed that the weapons used in the third world war would be so devastating that civilization as we know today would be gone, no longer exists. 
So he concluded, I know not with what weapons World War III will be fought, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. Uh, Mutaito, my question is, uh, regarding the pandemic, do you think that the day has come for society to acquire nature and animals' rights as a matter of survival? Thank you so much. Yeah, I thank you for sharing those uh, those thoughts and uh, yeah, and also for reiterating about you know aligning with the universal laws that govern all life. And I feel that the pandemic um, it um, it really is you know it's like a siren call for change. It's really highlighting to us. It's giving us you know, time to stop and step back. With all the global lockdown, nature is reviving itself. And, um, you know, and we have seen as a society how, um, you know, which functions in our society are essential and what is not essential. You know, what can we do without? And we can do without quite a lot, actually. You know, which functions are necessary for life and which functions are not. And I feel that um, also in the pandemic, it has uh, shown us that the world can take united concerted action together. You know, we can, we can take global action together in a very short space of time. We can change our behavior in a very short space of time. Um, it just requires people to agree. And um, with the huge existential crisis that we have with the biosphere, um, I don't feel we're gonna be solving that with anything less than recognizing the rights of nature. Um, yeah, we need big changes. And, uh, and the rights of nature shouldn't just be a gesture like it has been in some countries. Um, it needs to be really followed through and really integrated into all of the systems so that we basically design a new ecological civilization where our future generations can thrive. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Professor Deborah, for the question. And now I would like to hear Professor Gina Pompeo about questions and considerations. Welcome, Professor Gina. Hi. I would like to thank the University of Marília, Unimar, to be part of this event on behalf of Professor Jonathan Vita and Professor Mariana Santiago. I'm very glad to be here with, with, in this afternoon with also Professor Carlos Jorge, Professor Débora Costa and Sinara Lacerda. Hi to everyone. Uh, listen to Dr. Montaito's lecture is like getting a great renew of energy. The wonderful words in favor of environment rights that require critical reflection and lots of paradigm changes. Dr. Mutaito, your speech and words won't ever perish in vain. Saying as Lincoln, I was very glad, glad to, I can say that I was, it has happened a great pleasure to hear your papers and watch your videos. Erica, Luciana, Andrea, Marcia, Manuel, Patricia, Liana, Marcos, all the members of our re research group that are listening to us, they are very motivated with your words of strength and faith. Thank you very much, Professor Monta. We agree Thank that law needs to rethink its fundamental values on pro property. It must it must towards the protection of the ecosystem, health, and integrity. I'm from Brazil's northeast, very far from the south. As you can see, you can imagine I'm from Rocha. Then Professor uh, Deborah is from maybe Portugal. As you see, Brazil is bigger than whole Europe together. Uh, it is a special and multicultural place full of contrasts and contradictions. 
one side have beautiful beaches, strong indigenous influence in our culture. On the other side, the region presents a high, high poverty rate, extreme income inequality, and a desertification of ecosystem is in its countryside. In addition, there is a need for ad, ad, adequate and effective public policies mismanaged due to a government system that favors personalization of power. At the University of Fortaleza are likely survivors, a private philanthropic foundation Unifor was created in 1973 with the social responsibility of developing the region. The campus has 720,000 square meters of green area and an, um, an environment protection area for animal release. The university counts with 25,000 students in 40 undergraded and graduated courses. The master and doctorate courses in constitutional law uh, at the University of Fortaleza has also undergone a transformation in recent years. The courses started with the defense of constitutionalism, including the realization of social rights, defended personality rights, encouraged the liberal rights and opportunities, and meritocracy from the perspective of John Rawls. Advanced based on the ideas of Amartya Zen and Martin Nussbaum on capabilities approach. But, but despite this, the master and doctorate constitutional law fell indeed due the lake relation to the environment. Thus, in 2017, the Professors' Committee of the University of Fortaleza approved the inclusion of environmental law courses in the program curriculum. Then the research group, which I coordinated, called Economic, Political, and Legal Relations in Latin America, incorporated nature law and changed its name to Economic, Political, Legal, and Environmental relation in Latin America. So we started to study John Welkington, triple bottom line, uh, people, profit, planet. As you said, the current sustainability model. But we agree with Dr. Mountain, Montaito's speech that constitutionalism needs to rethink its foundation. In this context, the Brazilian constitution should include the environmental as its foundation of existence, since it is the main stakeholder. In, eight, in 2018, under my supervision, the doctoral student Marcos Mauricio Holanda, that is here with us, defended his thesis on economic degrowth and environmental protection. The thesis proposes the need to amend the Brazilian constitution in view of the principle of environmental protection. His research presents some proposal of for constitutional additive amendments of Brazilian constitution. In this way, the foundation, objectives, economic and international relations would start to prioritize the wealth environment for all living beings. The first article of the Brazilian constitution should include a sixth item, sustainable environment. The new article would be the Federative Republic of Brazil formed by the indissoluble union of states and municipalities and the federal district is a legal democratic state and it's founded on sovereignty, citizen, citizenship, dignity of the human person, social values of work and free enterprise, political pluralism, but more than this, sustainable environment. 
the constitutional inclusion of the sustainable environment as a constitutional foundation is an initial step. The second step is to include it as a goal of Brazilian Republic, the duty to protect the environment to ensure sustainability. Thus, the third Brazilian constitutional article should have an additive amendment, which would have the following text. The fundamental objectives of the Federative Republic of Brazil are to build a free, just, and solidary society, to guarantee national development, to eradicate poverty and substandard living conditions, and to reduce social and regional inequalities, to promote the well being of all without prejudice as to origin, race, sex, color, age, and any other forms of discrimination. And our suggestion, five, protect nature and ensure sustainability. To safeguard nature for the promotion of sustainability would be part of the defense of the constitution and the strengthening of the sustainable state with, of which Brazil was at the forefront. At the moment, there is a shift from anthropocentric restricted interpretation focused on a human being to the possibility of an expansion of constitutional hermeneutics placing nature, the planet, at a central position. A new cycle of nature protections is being formed. According to this, values and principles must be orientated towards the integral protection of life. In this way, inserting the sustainable environment as the foundation of the Republic and the scope of the state protection is to elevate to the extent of the Republic as a democratic and environmental state under the law. Uh, all this, Professor Monter, is to say that your points out the protection of nature and the concern for human beings are placed at a secondary level in the market strategies must change as a result there is no preservation of nature the term development is not properly represented and no sustainability is achieved economic growth cannot be considered equal to development the case of Brazil is exemplary. 50 million people, 50 million Brazilians live below the poverty line. And the country is the deft largest economy in the world. The country remain in the vaccine position of 75 in the human development index. Despite sustainability, permitted in Brazil constitution as a guideline for the state performance, it suffers from legislative interferences, omissions by the executive and implementation of policies. That's true that the Brazilian judiciary stands out by advancing new jurisprudence in favor of environment. The legal also contributes to this debate, the rights of nature. So, Professor Montaito, as Robert Frost says, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. There is always two paths in life. We have to choose one. I hope that the chosen path is in favor of nature's rights. This is what I choose. We conclude that Unimas initiative and the tireless defense of Dr. Mountain Ito are needed and much welcome because they are essential to the education process of society, a democratic and educated society in, in the environmental field will support a democratic and an environmental republic of law. Thank you very much. To, it's really a pleasure to hear all your 
all, all your books that we had a chance to study in our research group. Mariana and Jonathan, I'm very happy to be part of this afternoon with a very uh, important subject. We need to change and we need to start in the law courses. We cannot be just one, one uh, super extra tour. We cannot, we cannot be a part of all this. We need to recognize the facts and we need to make new laws. We need to provoke the policy parties to change what we have seen. The Northeast, Professor Munt, I hope you can come here. It's really a very interesting and a very beautiful place, but we need a lot of change because uh, as I told all of you, we have a lot of people that suffer and we have the, uh, a very uh, a kind of desertification that could be changed a long time ago. Um, even the Brazilian colonization is starting. Our king said the Northeast was, but it never happened. Since 1824, we wait for this change. The nature suffers and the people suffers with this, the kind of uh, exploitation we have here. And uh, I really believe that we professor and students, we can be the stakeholders to change what we see. And your speech is very important to motivate and to create a new kind of thoughts. We cannot even talk about planets, profit, and, and planet profit and, uh, and people as it was the best we could. We cannot talk about meritocracy and opportunities without thinking about the world preservation by the environment. So professors, Mariana, uh, Jonathan, Muta, Deborah, Carlos, uh, Sinara, for me, it's very important to be here because I'm sure that my students also will start to think in a different way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Gina, for, for your considerations. Uh, I don't know if Munta wants to, to say something about it or it's okay for you. I think um, it was not a question properly. Some comments. Yeah, th there's just one thing that occurred to me to mention, and uh, that's if you are going to be proposing changes to the Constitution, that um, instead of buying into the idea of sustainable development, which is tied to those three circles, you know, the old model, um, I would talk about regenerative development. Um, so instead of using the word sustainable, which is so, you know, I, I would say is all paradigm, we need to start talking about regenerative and associating that with nature's rights, because I feel that we are at a stage on our planet where we have to go further than just being sustainable, we have to regenerate. And, uh, and that's really what we are trying to create systems to regenerate our world. And uh, I feel this message has to come across. And the second thing is if making changes in the constitution, it really must be put in there somewhere that the nature's rights has to be integrated across all the policy areas. Because otherwise it just ends up in that fragmented, you know, and it becomes ineffective against corporations and, you know, it falls into the existing system. So it has to be integrated across all the policy areas and also has to be enforceable against corporations, governments, uh, people, you know, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Monta. It's a, a, an important point that I discuss a lot with my students. Uh, mm -hmm. It's different in Brazil because we are uh, uh, civil law country, so uh, we, and we have a strong constitution, so we need some kind of amendment. Uh, great. I'm looking forward to Brazil making this amendment for nature's yes, rights think, and lighting yes, the way for yes, the Yes, yes, yes. I think in your context, it's easier because the judge can to make a decision and change all the system, but in Brazil, we need more efforts, political and legal. 
and, and it's difficult because in law courses we have a kind of philosophy, it's too different, it's a kind of anthropocentric view, and we have to discuss this, it, it, that point in philosophy too, because we need a different concept about subject of law, not so anthropocentric. Exactly. But okay, I now I, I would like to hear uh, Professor Carlos about his consideration or questions. You're free. Now your turn. Nice to meet you, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Mariana by inviting me to that moment. Thank you so much, Mariana, for that. Uh, it's good to be here with the other important people that research about the 10. It's a, a, a great moment for me to uh, share that moment with the older uh, people. Uh, Muta, thank you for sharing your important knowledge uh, with us. It's a good, good opportunity for us, for our students. It's a good, good, good opportunity. Uh, my reflection, uh, I mean, a provocation question form is relational uh, of my formation. So uh, I hope to give my contribution with my perspective. Uh, we have now a singular and complex situation because China is the biggest economic and pollution, I mean, pollution of the world. Um, the country passed production to China and uh, with that also passed the pollution. It's a complex cycle. Today is China, tomorrow can be other, other country. I think that the capitalism puts the financial system above to everything. How is possible break that situation, in special the company? Do you understand me, Buta? Um, yeah, yeah, I do. And I feel that this is precisely why we need nature's rights, because all of, you know, all of the, the products the, um, the, that are being sold, you know, all of the consumption, everything comes from the earth. And, um, you know, and the, the corporations that control the food, that control the energy, you know, they're taking everything from the earth. And so if the earth has rights, you know, I feel that this really tackles the, you know, it gets really to the root of the problem. Um, yeah. And so, you know, so nature's rights, yes, it is political. It, it is political. And, um, but it's not only, it's not just political, it's also very fundamental. Um, because if the corporations keep carrying on in that way, we will have no future, we will have no humanity left, you know, and there'll be no planet. Well, there may be, you know, life forms of many different kinds of microorganisms and, and so on, but it would not be a, um, a hospitable environment for our species. And uh, yeah, so I really feel that nature's rights is the one thing that, you know, at the level of law, we can tackle this. I, I find, you know, in the green movement, um, people are not really so engaged with law, you know? But then you look at corporations, if they want to do something, first they get the laws changed and they get the laws stacked in their favor. You know, so we have to be smart too. And we have to get the laws stacked in favor of the people, you know, in favor of, um, in favor of nature. You know, we have to, yeah, I think uh, we cannot, uh, wait for governments and corporations to do this for us. We have to become proactive to protect our future. Oh, thank you for your answer for me. <laughs> thank you, Monta. Thank you, Professor Carlos. Uh, I would like to ask if my coordinator, Jonathan Vita, would like to make some comments, some question, say something to our students. Yes. And uh, but you mean uh, some comments on the lecture or some comments uh, just to close up the... the you the can event. choose what you want. No, it's because I, I think that the... Uh, I, I, actually, I think I'll make the, the same question that I did on the previous event, 
when the, the professor from the African continent made. Uh, because it's really interesting to know whether the rights of nature will be solved through a private sector uh, market approach or via governmental approach. Uh, I'm trying to do the same question actually, because I believe that uh, it's important to see the, the perspective coming from Scotland, which is a really, really, really beautiful country. Actually, I've been to Scotland and did the full round of Scotland uh, two years ago, and I really enjoyed it. And I have some many friends that are actually on the University of Aberdeen. One of them was the Dean in the private, in the, uh, dispute resolution sector. And I really want to see the perspective on the market approach or the public sector approach over the rights of nature. Okay, well, we can see where the market approach has taken us. Um, you know, and uh, if we, the market is driven by profit and and so can we rely on the market, which is, which is based on extraction for most of its profit rather than regeneration in the, and laws stacked in the favor that say it's okay for them to carry on the extraction um, to produce regenerative outcomes. I would say you need both, you know, you need, you need laws that uh, are designed to produce regenerative outcomes. And then you also need, you know, private sector that aligns with that kind of activity. So you cannot have um, a private sector trying to act for regeneration whilst the law permits destruction. It, uh, you know, I feel that the, they have to work together hand in hand. So we need both. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but uh, a second step, step to this question is, is it the which is the best approach under this we can say influenced by the public sector through to the private sector do you think it's better a positive influence or negative influence i mean only repression or uh, economic mm -hmm. incentives and all of that so because I... because the market for example provides normally for uh, positive incentives but actually choices are really fallible because everyone is going to try to find the same thing cheaper. And the cheaper way to do it is when you destroy the environment and do all of that. On the other hand, the pu public sector can regulate that and they can do it in a positive or in a negative way, uh, incentivizing or disincentivizing economically or otherwise those actions. So I want to know being said that the public way might be the way to address these issues. So are we going the positive way or the negative way? Well, the way I see nature's rights, it's a, it's a way of transforming society. So I'm all for it being law being used as an agent of social transformation, in which case it has to be positive. You know, so, so we're not saying we're against anything. We are for the rights of nature. We are for um, integrated um, human society, nature, human society and economy that, that all operates in synergy with each other. We're in favor of regenerative solutions. We subsidize regenerative businesses, regenerative business models. We put research into, um, you know, what, what fosters this regenerative approach. And we want to direct all of society's resources in that direction using law as a tool. So I'm, I'm not really, um, yeah, I'm not really foreseeing rights of nature just as a litigation tool. I, I see it as a, a much bigger instrument um, using the potential that the law has to, um, yeah, to bring about different outcomes. So, for example, the carbon mechanism, uh, tech, uh, carbon credit mechanism system is one way to do it, for example, that is provided on the international treaties. Now, just to see a, a tool that is actually used in that extent. Um, yeah, in some way, although I could probably comment on the, the carbon <laughs> system itself, but I, I think that's for a different lecture and a different forum. But uh, yes, in principle, yes. 
Thank you very much. Thank you. So Mariana, just one sec, okay. uh, just before talking to Mariana, we know that we have another agenda with professor and yeah, we have to invite her again to talk about carbon credit system. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. It's an excellent idea. <laughs> so you can return to talk to our students again and maybe sometime in the future in presence. It, it will be very, very nice to have yeah. you in Brazil and our university. That's Monta. wonderful. Uh, I, I think we are at the end of the event. So I would like to ask you to say something to my students, uh, your last words to enlighten them to continuing fighting for environmental and nature. Could you help me? It's not so easy in these times in Brazil. So please help me. Yeah, sure. Um, I would say that the most important thing is to really connect with, connect with your own essence, connect with um, where your essence meets nature, connect with that place within yourself where you know that you are nature, you're one with nature, you're one with, with the whole biosphere and you're one with each other. And, and from that place, your heart will tell you what is right. Your heart will tell you about the brave new world that we, only we can create. And it's very important to stay positive. It's very important um, not to fall into that line of thinking that says, oh, what can we do? You know, we are powerless against these big organizations and institutions and governments. No, they only exist because we exist. And we just need to get people like us on board. Uh, there was an experiment uh, called the 100th monkey experiment done in Japan, where they taught some monkeys a skill. And uh, they found that monkeys on different islands were also doing this skill. And they found that somehow by teaching a small group, it went into the kind of collective consciousness of monkeys and they all acquired this skill. So from that, it was figured out that um, it only takes something like 0.1% of a group to get something before it goes in the collective consciousness to everyone. And so we don't need to bring everybody on board. We just need to bring a sizable proportion of people just like us thinking in the same way and the change will come. Hi. <laughs> very, very good. Thank you. Thank you, my friend, for your last words. And I feel uh, it's true in my heart. Thank you for all the sensitivity and knowledge. And I hope to see you soon in a better yeah. condition outside <laughs> Zoom. Definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will, Thank I will you speak all. a little Portuguese now so uh, to my students, OK? okay. Don't worry. Uh, Thank you. Meus queridos alunos, é, obrigada pela presença de todos vocês hoje no nosso, no nosso evento. Eu sempre digo que não se faz internacionalização se os, se os alunos não, não participam, não estão com a gente no projeto. A gente precisa sempre da colaboração de vocês. Uh, eu tenho plena convicção de que foi uma atividade mais pesada Uh, do que o normal, porque é uma atividade em inglês, então requer mais e mais atenção, não é a nossa língua de origem, mas mesmo assim eu fico muito feliz em ver que vocês participam, se interessam em evoluir, em aprender uh, e ter acesso a um conhecimento de alto nível como nós tivemos hoje. Então, muito obrigada por estarem conosco, eu gostaria de agradecer também a professora Débora, que daqui a pouco já vai estar recebendo o salário da Unimar, porque também toda hora está aqui. A professora Gina, que é a primeira participação dela no nosso evento, que me deixa muito honrada pela força, pela mulher que ela é, pela pessoa que ela é, o que ela representa na pós-graduação em Direito no Brasil. E ela também daqui a pouco vai cobrar salário, porque ela ainda volta algumas vezes. E o professor Jonathan, não sei como vai resolver isso. E ao amigo Carlos, que também faz parte da organização desse evento, que nos ajuda com a parte técnica, assim como a Sinara também. É, toda semana estamos aí às voltas para realizar isso, então tem que também fazer esse agradecimento a toda a parte técnica, 
a professora Valquíria também, né? o evento tem um pré-evento, tem um pós-evento, uh, tem a emissão dos certificados, é, é complicado, não é tão simples, requer um esforço enorme dessa equipe, e em ver que os alunos valorizam isso, estão presentes, isso me deixa muito feliz, nos motiva a continuar mantendo sempre o nível do, do projeto. É, eu vou passar a palavra agora para as nossas convidadas, para elas se despedirem dos alunos, então, professora Débora, Vamos começar pela professora Débora. É, eu queria agradecer novamente a todos, todos os que estiveram aqui conosco, no nosso, ao nosso lado aqui, o Jonathan, a Gina, o Carlos, a Sinara, que depois tem uma atividade meio louca aí de né, é, conceder certificados, etc. E eu queria deixar registrado aqui, Mariana, Além da minha gratidão pelo convite, porque eu fico realmente muito feliz, eu queria deixar registrado o teu sucesso, é, que teu trabalho foi reconhecido na United Nations, é, Harmony with Nature, e dizer que eu já estou me sentindo uma ativista convicta, porque se nós não realmente não mudarmos é, a nossa forma de conduta, é, nós não vamos progredir, porque realmente o progresso vem de dentro para fora, não é? Então, com essa nossa atitude ética, de amor pela natureza, que realmente é a natureza que nos dá vida. E dizer que eu estou muito feliz e imagina a sorte que teus alunos têm de ter você aí de professora. Então, obrigada a todos. Um abraço. Obrigada, querida amiga. Professora Gina, a palavra é sua, para sua despedida. Mariana, muito obrigada aí pelo convite, realmente a Mariana me provocou, primeiro eu convidei, a Mariana vai estar conosco em novembro, não é? dando o módulo do nosso seminário especial, e ela disse, ah Gina, então depois você vem aqui, sendo que eu vim primeiro do que ela lá, né? depois foi logo na semana, assim, cinco dias para eu estudar a professora Munta e Ito, não é? eu confesso que eu não conhecia, mas fiquei encantada, é, eu que saí de um viés liberal, né? eu, tô, eu ainda estou naquela coisa lá do John Rawls, né? meritocracy e liberdade de oportunidades, e de repente a minha equipe, o meu grupo, viu, professora Débora, eu, eu coordeno um grupo que era relações econômicas, jurídicas, políticas e ambientais na América Latina, agora eu acho que só tem ambientais. Né? O grupo está todo presente, eles são realmente ativistas, eles me colocam dentro do barco e me levam e fazemos passeatas contra a questão é, da venda de propriedades nas praias, na Sabiaguaba, enfim. É, trouxemos primeiro o Michel Prieu, o Henrique Leff e agora a professora Munta Ito. Eu estou vendo a hora eu realmente dizer, botar aqui na minha testa, é, eu, eu faço parte né, desse grupo. Então, quer dizer, eu fico muito honrada é, viver é realmente fazer escolhas, eu gosto muito do poema que eu coloquei lá do, do Robert Frost, né? tem sempre dois caminhos, a gente tem que saber escolher o bom caminho, e o bom caminho é o lado da Mariana, isso eu já notei, né? então o meu bom caminho é do lado da Mariana, seja no COMPED, seja nos eventos, seja na esfera do direito internacional ou do direito ambiental. Então, eu quero agradecer a Mariana, ao Jonathan, dizer que é um prazer estar aqui com o Jorge, com a Sinara e com a Débora, e, sobretudo, é, falar desse grupo maravilhoso que eu tenho, que é o RepJal, e espero tê-los em breve conosco, tá? para que a gente possa debater, trazer soluções e tentar conciliar não é? esse Brasil tão grande, tão louco, que sofre tanto com a, tanta é, falta de, é, de uma igualdade real, para as pessoas e falta de proteção com a natureza. Enfim, Mariana, passei uma tarde muito agradável com vocês, aprendi bastante e espero sim é, ter outras oportunidades de encontro. Um beijo para vocês todos e para os alunos que nos escutam. Obrigada, professora Gina. É uma honra recebê-la e semana que vem estaremos juntas de novo com o nosso convidado, que eu ainda não é surpresa, ainda vou, vou anunciar apenas amanhã, mas já adianto que vamos ter mais uma, um alemão aqui no nosso, na, no nosso programa. E seja lá o que Deus quiser, hein, professora Gina? Maria, tá aí, eu alemão. indico outra pessoa, pelo amor <risos> de Deus. Não, não, é, ele vai falar inglês, vai fazer essa gentileza, então 
pode ficar tranquila que vai dar tudo certo. Tô ansi estou ansiosa também para conhecer o seu grupo de estudos, fico feliz com essa iniciativa surgindo na Unifor, que é uma grande universidade, um PPGD nota 6, né? então isso precisa ser dito, isso precisa ser lembrado. É uma honra muito grande a sua participação aqui no evento. E eu vou, falar, eu vou passar a palavra agora para o meu colega Carlos, para que possa se despedir também dos nossos alunos. Bom, Mariana, mais uma vez eu gostaria de te agradecer pelo, pelo convite. É, casou sem perceber que o convite foi feito bem, bem no dia do administrador. Eu sou administrador de formação, né? então foi um presente aí que você me proporcionou. Né? É, como eu disse para você pela mensagem, na mensagem, é, uma coisa é falar o inglês ali de maneira é, no dia a dia, outra coisa é estar aqui com a pressão toda de ter uma palestrante internacional falando, tem tenho, é, tenho uma atenção um pouco maior, mas independente disso, quero ter contribuído aí até com a minha formação, que não é tanto dentro do direito, né, mas se relaciona com empresas, se relaciona com outros tipos de, de construções, e agradeço aí a oportunidade de ter tido contato com a Débora, com a Gina, é, com o pessoal, que, a, com a Munta, que é o pessoal que é de fora da nossa casa, né? e falar que é sempre um prazer estar aqui com você, com o Jonathan, com a Sinara, e estou à disposição para novas construções conjuntas, viu? E deixo um abraço aí para os nossos alunos também. Obrigada, Carlos. E eu também aqui, fora do script, já vou chamar a Sinara para falar um pouco aí sobre o evento da FEPOD. Passa um spoiler para a gente, Sinara. Oi, professora. Olá, meus caros. Pois é, estamos organizando o primeiro evento virtual da FEPOD. Estamos ansiosos já na fase de elaboração de edital. Então, aos nossos alunos, já fiquem atentos. Nós vamos manter o padrão de resumo expandido. Então, fica aí o convite a todos. A perspectiva é que seja dia 10 e 11 de dezembro. Nós contamos com a presença de todos vocês. Vocês serão incomodadas, viu, professora Débora e professora Gina? Vocês vão participar da nossa comissão científica. Então, já sintam-se convidadas e, posteriormente, incomodadas. Tá? Fica aí o nosso primeiro contato com os nossos alunos. Abemos congresso, então contamos com todos vocês lá. Obrigada, Sinara. Eu tenho certeza que, sob a sua presidência, teremos aí um grande congresso da FEPOD, mais um. Uh, minha gente, foi um prazer estar com vocês essa tarde. Eu vou encerrando aqui, depois desse protocolo final, a nossa comunicação. E não, só não pode que... esquecer de avisar o Zé, o evento da, da sexta ah, na próxima semana. Agora, Jonathan vai fazer essa parte aí do... A burocrática, que a professora Mariana é ruim de protocolo, mas professor Jonathan, que é nosso coordenador, passa seus avisos, faça seu, não, seu é... mexão. Faça é... seu mexão aí. Não. Sim, bem, pessoal, é, não, foi realmente um prazer, enfim, é, mais um evento internacional. É, eu sei que no, no começo, digamos assim, é, eu falei inglês, nem todo mundo tem aquele domínio, né? E então eu evitei falar sobre os nossos eventos. A gente vai ter é, sexta-feira, 19 horas. É a continuação aí do nosso projeto, é, que nesse período de férias está só falando sobre reforma tributária, né? e dessa vez é um tema bastante interessante, que é reforma tributária pelo judiciário. Então, é ver essas decisões que foram dadas pelo judiciário, especialmente durante a pandemia, no plenário virtual do STF, e a gente vai ter aí especialistas, é, tem o, o Fábio Fraga, do PJT, né? que é um curso de análise jurisprudencial em matéria tributária, o Gustavo Brigagão e o Walter Lobato, que todo mundo já conhece, que é o presidente da BDF e o presidente da ABRADT, e a professora Maria de Fátima ali nos comandos, e eu atrapalhando mais do que ajudando todo mundo. Na segunda-feira, dia 14, a gente vai ter o evento do professor Bruno, né? é, com o pessoal de Cabo Verde, vai ser muito interessante sobre a arbitragem tributária, Aí tem na próxima quarta o evento da professora Marina, que ela não avisou ainda, mas tem um outro aviso agora, que esse é fundamental, a gente tem um evento que está sendo organizado em, pela Unimar, em, pela, por várias universidades, né, um pool de universidades brasileiras, portuguesas e de Cabo Verde, vai ter a apresentação de professores do programa, eu vou estar lá, a professora Maria de Fátima, o professor Bruno, e vamos ter a apresentação dos nossos doutorandos e alunos especiais, no caso o Lívia e a Jaqueline, vão fazer a apresentação, e vai ficar, então, a quinta toda e a sexta toda 
é, a quinta toda e a sexta toda é, no nosso canal aqui do YouTube. Então, é, as inscrições são gratuitas, estão abertas, olhem lá nas nossas redes sociais é, e se inscrevam no canal sempre para receber as notificações. E lá no Insta vocês vão ter todas as informações para esse evento que recomendo assim forte, fortemente. Então, Dito isso, queria só agradecer a todos, não se esqueçam de ir lá, seguir a gente nas redes sociais, seguir aqui no YouTube, clicar no sininho, curtir o vídeo, e nos vemos aí nessa sexta-feira, 19 horas. Obrigado, pessoal. Obrigada, Jonathan, e parabéns aí pelas iniciativas, viu? Um orgulho ah, de fazer obrigado, parte parabéns. desse projeto, desse novo projeto aí tecnológico da Unimar, idealizado por você. Tchau, tchau, pessoal. Obrigado. Até semana que vem. Tchau, tchau, pessoal. Até, semana que... Até essa semana, Maria. Não é verdade. Que vem. É verdade. <risos>